Yesterday we covered different network technologies and finished looking at DSL, ADSL, a little bit about coaxial cable and optical fiber. Let's return a little bit about DSL or ADSL and explain what this means and go back to our example which I can do live today. This is just a plot of the frequencies available across the copper line for the ADSL connection where <coughs> some are used for voice for the normal voice call via the telephone line and then the rest are used for the data transfer, your internet access and you can make a voice call using ADSL and at the same time be downloading data, the well, downloading data, the downstream and uploading data and you transmit the voice at a certain range of frequencies, upload data or upstream here and downstream here. The exact separation varies amongst the different ADSL standards, there, there are variations. This shows a spectrum of one megahertz, that is the bandwidth available is about one megahertz. With ADSL2 and ADSL2+, plus, that actually goes up to two megahertz. This is just a same diagram that I have here. These were the maximum speeds we can achieve with different variations of ADSL going from 8 megabits per second downlink up to 24 megabits per second with the ADSL 2 plus standard. Let's look at, the, at an example of an ADSL modem and explain a little bit more about what it shows us or what it tells us and then talk about how the data rate relates to the quality of the signal and sometimes the, or, and often the distance. In this case I will connect to my own ADSL modem at home. So at home I have an ADSL modem running and I've connected to it and it has some uh, basic interface for looking at data or configuring the modem. So at home my modem has a connection to the telephone line which then goes out to some local telephone exchange. and my computer connects to the modem. <coughs> Here's the telephone line. I don't know how far, I don't know where the exchange is. Oh, well, I do know, it's inside Tamasat Rangsit. This, from my modem's perspective, this is the near end of the line, and this is the far end. That is, from my modem, that's far away, this is near to the modem. We just use that terminology uh, when we look at some statistics. What can we see about the modem? The system status will at least tell us at what speed I'm connected to at the moment. Upstream speed, or line status is up, it's working. Upstream speed, 885 kilobits a second. Downstream speed, 7,168 kilobits per second. So about 7 megabits per speed per second download rate with that connection. That may change depending upon the quality of the line. So with ADSL, although that's the maximum that I can achieve, if I had a poor quality line, telephone line from here to here, it may be lower. Let's look at some other details of the ADSL connection. If I can remember, I want to look at my wide area network connection using ADSL. Uh, and this is the channel data. 
again just shows the data rate that we're connected to at the moment. We're using AD, or this is using ADSL 2 plus in this case, the standard or the technology being used. And the data rates at the near end, that is download coming to the near end and at the far end. Now if we look at some more detailed data of that line, the, some statistics about the telephone line from the, at the far end here. What does this show us? It shows us something about the signal strength or the signal quality. A noise margin. That's a signal to noise ratio for this line. We'd like this to be high. The higher the better. That is the, this is the ratio between the signal strength and the amount of noise. The stronger the signal compared to the noise, the better the quality of the signal that is received. The more noise, the lower the signal to noise ratio. And the signal to noise ratio is the noise margin here, 8 decibels which is okay. Another useful thing is the attenuation. That's how much power we lose across the link. So that's from here to here. 3 dB. That should be as low as possible. The higher that value, the worse the quality of my link. The further the distance we have from our modem to the exchange, the larger the attenuation will be. Here it's 3 dB, which is quite low. We'll see some values later on another plot that show a relationship between the attenuation and the data rate, the maximum data rate we can achieve. The rest, all this, shows about information about what frequencies are being used. In ADSL 2 Plus, in this case, in fact, we have 2, mega, 2 megahertz available from 0 up to about 2 megahertz. And what ADSL does is use a technique called discrete multitone, DMT, that breaks the, that 2 megahertz into tones or sub-channels or sometimes referred to as bins. So it divides this 2 megahertz into sub-channels all about 4.3 kilohertz. Gives us around 500 subchannels. 500 times 4 is 2 megahertz. And that's what these numbers are representing here. They're representing how much data can be sent on a particular subchannel. This is for the far end. Note that the first, this is not to scale, that's the first thing, this diagram. That is, the voice is only a small part here, the download is much larger than the voice. Uh, the first subchannels, the first several kilohertz, is reserved for voice. So from my ADSL perspective, the, the data being transmitted upstream is not sent on the first several kilohertz. That's reserved for voice. The numbers here indicate the amount of data that can be sent on each channel or subchannel. In hexadecimal, the larger the value, the better. Zero means that there's no data being sent on that channel. Without seeing, without working out the exact values, we can see that, okay, the first subchannels, nothing's being sent, and then from, from maybe six through to close to 31, not 32, there is data that can be sent along those subchannels. They correspond to the upstream subchannels here. The first six are for the voice, and then we can send data on the upstream subchannels. And then the rest is all zero, that is, we send no data for, to the far end. This can sometimes be used to indicate how good the signal is, because if you get lower values or you use less of the subchannels, then that's because the ADSL technology is adapting because of the poor signal strength and sends less data. So the lower the quality of the signal, 
the less data you can send, the less subchannels it, it will use, and the less bits it will send per subchannel. The other thing that we can look at is from the downstream perspective. At the near end. We've got a much higher signal to noise ratio, 24 dB now, that's good. The higher the value the better compared to uh, before, uh, compared to the far end. Attenuation is still very small, 5 decibels is very small. And we see for downstream, we don't use the first range of frequencies or the first subchannels. We start here, which is what, if this is 32, then this is about 40 or, or 45. And then use the subchannels all up to the end point. So you can think of one number here representing the bits that we send on a single 4.3 kilohertz subchannel. So we have many small channels here being used. The more we have used and the higher the numbers here represents the more data we can send at one point in time. That is the higher data rate we can achieve. Usually turns out that the higher frequencies we cannot send so much data. That is the, the as we start to move to higher frequencies that's here where we see we're going down 4, 3, 2, that's around here, the quality is poorer and that's why we got lower numbers here. So ADSL divides the total bandwidth into subchannels and dynamically works out based on the quality of the signal how much data it can send in each subchannel. In my case, I have a very good link and I can get the full 7 megabits per second. Probably if I paid for more, I'd get much faster than that. But if you are further, further from the exchange or you had a very old cable, then these values may be lower and you may not be able to achieve the full data rate that uh, you pay for. Note that my attenuation around 5 decibels, which is quite low. I'll show you a graph that compares the decibels or the atten attenuation in decibels to the data rate that we can achieve. Any questions on ADSL so far before I move away from this? You don't need to remember what all these things mean, it's just giving a, an example. This is a plot, um, you can just see it, from Wikipedia. It's a plot that gives the relationship between the data rate that we can achieve with ADSL, the line rate, measured in megabits per second from 0 up to 24, compared to the attenuation across our line, measured in decibels. And you can, there are three different technologies represented here, ADSL or ADSL1, the green one here, ADSL2 and ADSL2+. They've been, there have been improvements of ADSL over time up to ADSL2+, which gives us the theoretical maximum data rate of 24 megabits per second. But as our attenuation increases, the maximum data rate that you can achieve goes down. So the original ADSL maximum was 8 megabits per second. With an attenuation of 30 dB, you could achieve that. But an attenuation of 50 dB, you're at about 5 megabits per second is the maximum you can achieve. Attenuation of 70 dB and the maximum is around 1 or 2 megabits per second. That is, the further you are from the exchange, as the distance increases, the t attenuation increases. The further you are from the exchange, the lower the maximum data rate that you can achieve. 
and similar the lower the quality of your cable the lower the maximum data rate you can achieve. ADSL 2 plus goes up to a maximum of 24 megabits per second but only if you have a very low attenuation from 0 to 10 dB. 30 dB and you're down to 16. In other words, the closer you are to the exchange, the better it is or the better chance of getting a higher data rate. So you could replace attenuation with distance from exchange and you get a similar shape plot distance. So normally it, uh, I'll show you one more plot that illustrates that relative to distance. I think I have it. This website, I think, has a similar plot of DSL speed versus distance. Let's hope so. Basically the same plot. It's, it's got the attenuation here from 1 up to 90 dB, but it's also got the, the distance, that map to distance going from 100 meters up to 6,500 meters, six and a half kilometers. So if you're three kilometers from the telephone exchange with ADSL 2, maximum is around eight or nine megabits per, per second. If you're one kilometer, then you can achieve the full 24. If you're five kilometers, then you're lucky to get a connection, maybe one or two megabits per second if you're lucky. So the distance and the attenuation are directly proportional. How far are you from a telephone exchange? Well, there's no way to know. You need to physically measure that. It's the length of the, the cable, not necessarily the distance, the direct distance to the telephone exchange. So these are the maximum data rates possible. In practice, you may achieve less than this. Coaxial cable, we talked about optical fiber access. Let's move on to how do we, what are the different options we have for transferring data inside the core network as opposed to the access network. There are different technologies that we can use inside the core network. So this is the networks that are normally operated by the internet service providers, the telecom companies that connect the customers, to the customers' networks together. Different options, we'll go through some of them. Telephone-based digital circuits, because telephone networks have been around for a long time across the globe, then people the telecom companies that wanted to provide data services to other companies and to end users made use of those telephone networks and built their new networks based on existing or similar technologies. So there's a strong relationship between some of the core network technologies and telephone based networks. We'll go through some examples of them. Packet switching wide area networks so we know about uh, that we know that a telephone connection is using circuit switching 
where we, when we pick up the telephone, we establish a circuit from the source to the endpoint and transfer our data across that. It's got nothing to do with packets. We create a circuit and send signals across that circuit. An alternative is to use packet switching, where we take our data, break it into individual small packets, and send them one at a time to a switch, which then sends it to the next switch, and eventually all the packets get to the destination. We'll go through some examples quickly of some virtual circuit packet switching technologies, where they use packets, but they still establish a connection from source to destination before they send those packets. And of course, a datagram packet switching technology is IP networks, using the internet protocol where we have routers, and we have a packet we send to a router, the router sends to the next router until it gets to the destination. That's what we use in the internet today. We will not go through any more detail of how IP works right now. And alternatives include wireless networks, which we'll cover after we go through the core or through the wired network technologies. Let's go through telephone-based digital circuits. So the public switch telephone network uses circuit switching. Telephone companies originally designed these networks to carry digital voice calls. So before people were so much interested in sending data, then the networks were designed to carry voice calls and later extended to carry data. So most of the design of the networks is based upon this concept of a single voice call. A single voice call occupies 4 kilohertz of bandwidth, which is equivalent to about 64 kilobits per second for data. Because if we have 8,000 samples per second at 8 bits per sample, if we look at the Nyquist rate, then that becomes with 4 kilohertz, if we sample at twice the maximum frequency, we get 8,000 samples per second. 8,000 times 8 is 64,000 bits per second. So in fact, we can think of one voice circuit or one voice call. It can carry the equivalent of 64 kilobits per second of data. So many of the technologies refer to a single voice circuit. And operate in multiples of a single voice circuit. So the circuit switch networks of telephone companies can be used to provide private or dedicated circuit networks between endpoints. That is, the network that is built for voice calls can be also used to provide private networks, say, between a company's offices, a bank between all its telephone branches, and so on typically in a point-to-point -point topology, but sometimes other topologies are used. Let's look, look at some examples. We're not going to go through how these technologies work. We're going to try and mention their names, mention their relationship to things we know, whether it's circuit switching, packet switching, some of the typical data rates, so that you're aware of them, at least, and you can compare them. The first one is plesionchronous digital hierarchy. It's a range of uh, technologies, well, one technology that includes a range of different data rates and used mainly for point-to-point -point links using existing copper telephone lines. There are, in fact, two variations of this technology. One was developed in Europe and one in the US. Uh, so they have slightly different terminology and slightly different data rates, but similar concepts. In the US, it's referred to as what's called the T hierarchy because the different data rates that are available are numbered T1, T2, T3, T4, and, and so on. In Europe, the E hierarchy, E1 through to E4. It allows to use a copper line and to send data across that copper line at different data rates, where the data rates are based upon multiples of the single voice circuit. 
A single voice circuit allows for 64 kilobits per second, 0.064 megabits per second. The T1 standard allows you to transmit 24 voice circuits across the single line. It uses multiplexing. Let's illustrate the concept. We can think of, we have a multiplexer with multiple input lines coming in. One, two, three, line number 24. And we multiplex all the signals from those 24 and have the one output line. That's our basic concept of multiplexing. where we can think conceptually that if we have each line represents a single voice circuit or equivalent of 64 kilobits per second, we apply multiplexing and combine them together into a single, single signal and transmit them out here and with the T1 standard at a data rate of 1.544 megabits per second. Twenty-four times sixty-four is slightly less than one point five four four megabits per second because we have to introduce some overhead. So, in fact, we have twenty-four channels plus I think there's one channel for overhead, that which is the overhead to perform the multiplexing. So, a T one line allows a data rate of around 1.5 megabits per second and you can connect between two endpoints in a point-to-point -point configuration using that data, data line. You don't need to have 24 coming in, that is you as a company or your company could buy or rent the multiplexer and, or multiplexer and demultiplexer devices, put this in one office, in fact you'd go to a telecom company and they'd rent it to you, put it in one office or one building connect to this, not necessarily by 24 different cables, but it would provide an interface to another technology. Ethernet, for example. So in your LAN, you'd have, running out of space, some router, and all your computers eventually connected inside your LAN in your office to the router, and that would connect to this special device which connects the Ethernet network to the T1 link. And this would be the part of the network of the telecom company. So this is, say, some office building or, or an office of a company. And the telecom company would have this cable maybe going across Bangkok. and goes to the office building, the other office building of the company. And similar, they can connect this device to their Ethernet network there. So when we have two separate offices on the other side of the city, then what we could do is connect them via a T1 line and have a 1.5 megabit per second link between those two offices. And there are different levels that provide higher data rates. T2 is, in fact, a combination of, what is it, four T1s, effectively. Four T1s, or four by 24 voice circuits, gives us 96, 6.3 megabits per second. Four times 1.5 plus some overhead. So if 1.5 is not enough, you need more capacity, in fact, you could pay the telecom company to rent a T2 circuit between your two offices. Using the same concept then. 
and similar T3 at 44 megabits per second, T4 at 274 megabits per second. Same concept in the European standard except there's slightly different numbers there. Instead of operating on 24 voice circuits, it's on 30 here. So 2 megabits, 8, 34, 140 megabits per second. So this technology has been used in core networks to connect over a, usually a wide area networks between office buildings to connect uh, between different routers inside uh, an IP network over distances of kilometers, tens of kilometers usually, and even over uh, between countries. The technology uses the copper links, so it transmits using the copper lines, using electrical signals. And the basic thing that you do is that if you want to get access to another site, so SIT wants to connect their two campuses together, what we would do is we'd go to a telecom company and we'd, try and we'd ask them if we could lease one of their circuits from them. So they already have the cables in the ground across Bangkok and if they have a connection between the two locations we would lease a circuit, would ask for a particular level, whatever we desire, and pay per month to access and we'd have that full two megabits per second dedicated between our two campuses. The data rates are quite low for today's requirements and PDH was improved and the improvement was the synchronous digital hierarchy. And again, there were two different variations. One for the, what's called the international version, SDH, and in the US it evolved to something slightly different again called SONIC, synch synchronous optical network. But again, similar concepts. And multiple different levels, starting from STS-1 and going through, in fact, there may be even more than STS-256. And this SDH used optical fiber. So PDH, designed to use the copper lines that existed in telephone networks, but there are limitations in using the copper cables, the amount of bandwidth available. SDH is designed to use optical fiber, much higher bandwidth and it allows us to achieve much higher data rates. And some of the, the levels are listed here. Different terminologies used, this is the name of the standard and because we use optical fiber it refers to the optical carrier. And we get bit rates starting around 50 megabits per second up to common ones today, 1.25 megabits per second, two and a half, oh sorry, 1.25 gigabits per second, two and a half gigabits per second, 10 gigabits per second. So these are common, commonly used between cities and between countries and even within cities to connect different locations together using point-to-point -point links and sometimes even ring topologies to connect a set of locations together. Still all the numbers are based upon voice circuits but we don't talk about carrying voice circuits anymore, we care about the data rate. We have an example, let's find an example network that illustrates some of those technologies. This one's a little bit old, but uh, not the best example, but here is, it's quite old, it's TRUE's network or the international network between Thailand and other countries, US, Hong Kong, the UK, 
Singapore, Malaysia. It doesn't say what technology is being used, but we see that the data rates being used, and most likely I've, that these are all using SDH for the international connections. The 10 gigabits per second links would be SDH. So here would be an SDH point-to-point -point link between one endpoint in Thailand and one in Malaysia using optical fiber transmitting at 10 gigabits per second. Another example Note that we've, the technologies are referred to as optical carriers. So OC1 is 51, OC3 155 megabits per second, OC24, OC192. This is a, a network across US of one of the operators there, QWest. Uh, it's a bit old, but it gives some examples you can see some of the cities across the US and the links between the cities that that operator has. And the different colors refer to different levels. The black links are DS3. That's part of PDH. If you look at the PDH slide, DS3 I think is equivalent to a, a T3 link. OC3 is an optical carrier up to OC192, which is the 10 megabit per second, a 10 gigabit per second SDH technology. So the white links, uh, 10 gigabit per second links, light blue, uh, whatever, a quarter of uh, 2.5 gigabits per second and so on. So this operator has links between different cities across the US using SDH and PDH technologies. So all the customers of this operator in the Los Angeles will connect into their, the operator's center point there, exchange, and all their traffic will be carried across these links to the particular destinations. Whether the customers are individuals uh, accessing via an internet service provider or they're, they're companies which lease portions of these links. So PDH and more so now SDH are used for connections within cities, between cities and between countries. What about alternatives? Packet switching technologies have been developed and been used for data communications between uh, over a wide area network over the last 30 years. Where in the past a telecommunications company would deploy their own links and create a packet switch network. Originally usually using virtual circuit packet switching, now mainly using datagram packet switching. Some of the virtual circuit packet switching technologies include X25, quite old now, frame relay, and asynchronous transfer mode. And datagram packet switching internet protocol. We won't go through how they work, just mention their names. X25 is quite, o quite old now. It provided data rates of 64 kilobits per second. <coughs> 30 years ago, that was okay. Today, that's nothing up to 2 megabits per second. It's largely been replaced by other technologies, but it was one of the first major one that was used, especially, for example, by banks. Banks have many branches, and now ATMs spread across the country. They need to connect them together. So they may, the bank itself may build or deploy its own packet switching network, connecting all those branches and uh, ATMs together so they can exchange data across their own network. Mainly used na now if it's uh, 
in an old network and there was no need or, or no money available to upgrade. It was replaced mainly by frame relay, which increase, increased the data rate up to 1.5 megabits per second, eventually up to 44 megabits per second. Similar to X25, but it was more efficient. It was a newer technology and faster. An example of how such a network, either X25 or Frame Relay, may be set up is shown here. Let's say we have our local LAN inside our campus. And we have a router that's going to connect us to outside, to the rest of the internet. Then what we may do is connect that router, instead of doing something like this to connect between two offices, a point-to-point -point link, we may pay an internet service provider to connect into their packet switch network. So an internet service provider or a telecom company may have their own packet switch network across Bangkok, which would be made up of a set of switches. Packet switching, if you can remember back to ITS 323 when we introduced packet switching, we have a set of switches connected together and we send our packets to one of the entry point switches and it goes through the network until it gets to the destination and out to the router and the internet in this case. So these would be switches, there would be more than five, switches across say Bangkok connected together via multiple links and all owned and operated by a telecom company or an internet service provider. We would pay them per month to access their network we would send, connect to one of their switches, and then they would use packet switching to deliver our packets to the destination and then onto the rest of the internet or the destination network. This is a similar concept with X25, frame relay, and even ATM. From the internet protocol's perspective, that entire packet switch network is one link. When we would draw and look at the internet protocol, we would draw things like this. A cloud, a router, some hosts attached, when we looked at the internet protocol. We said that routers are used to connect subnets together, where the cloud represents either a single cable, maybe the cloud represents a PDH link, just one cable going between two devices, or the cloud could represent an entire network, such as a packet switch network here. So this may be our Ethernet LAN, and our computer's attached to that, so it's, the cloud represents a switched LAN in that case, a router, an IP router, and then this cloud may be a frame relay network across Bangkok. Where in fact, our IP packets go from the router to some switches. So if this is our switched network here, using frame relay, our packets will go to one of the switches, switch to the next one, and eventually to the destination router. So from this frame relay network, source, destination, and then use the next technology here. So from the IP's perspective, this network is just some cloud or some subnet in the network. But it may be much more complex than a single link. Asynchronous transfer mode was really the next improvement. We went from X25 to frame relay to ATM. And provides many more features than frame relay, faster data rates, and is still used widely in different networks. One example where it's used commonly is in mobile telephone networks, not in, the, of course, the wireless part, but connecting the base stations together 
ATM is commonly used. And I think that's all we want to say about those. Just examples of virtual circuit packet switching technologies. Some of them, well, they're all still in use. Mainly ATM is the most common one. Data rates up to 600 megabits per second. That just puts them into perspective of uh, roughly the, our layered stack. They are mainly focusing on the physical and data link layer. It's not quite clear cut. X25 had its own network layer. ATM is a mix, includes portion of a network layer. And in fact, ATM can make use of other wide area network technologies. The links between the ATM switches may use SDH. There may be an optical link here, for example. So if this is a link across Thailand, uh, a network across Thailand, we may have switches in different cities using ATM. And the links between those switches may be using SDH. They may, may be optical fiber links at different data rates. Nowadays, mostly, even if we have these networks here, we run the internet protocol on top of them. That is the network layer, IP, 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 in most cases. So, a quick coverage of core network technologies or selected core network technologies. We, we use existing telecom networks, circuit switching, that is the telephone based network, using PDH and SDH, and packet switching technologies as well, which are more suited for sending data traffic because data traffic varies over time usually, and therefore packet switching can handle that better than circuit switching. And in fact, many of the technologies can be used together. For example, ATM uses SDH as a physical layer. So the main point from that is to, that you can recognize when someone says ATM, you don't think about money, you think about a packet switch network. And same with X25 and frame relay. And if you hear about SDH, then you think, OK, yeah, that uses optical fiber. You don't need to remember the data rates. We haven't covered how it works. But it's to be aware of some of those technologies. And there are others as well that we haven't covered. But they would be the main ones. So that's covered core networks and previously access networks. Only looking at wired networks. Now we will look at wireless networks. And you know the basics of wireless communications. Let's recap on some things we know already, I think. What's the benefit of wireless communications? We have untethered communications. We're not connected to anything, no wires. We're not tethered. Our device that we use to access a network is not connected to some other device physically. That's the main benefit. And that, in some cases, enables quick installation. I don't have to plug a wire in. I just turn on my device and the connection is automatically established. And especially useful when deploying and maintaining cables is expensive. I have, uh, I, you want to build, start your own company when you graduate and you're going to start your own internet service provider. You think you've got a, there's a good opportunity. If you want to use wired technologies, then either you need to pay some other company to use their network, that costs money, or you need to dig your own holes across Bangkok and lay the cables. And that costs much more money because getting the
permissions to dig the holes, digging the holes and laying the cables is very expensive. So one alternative you have is to use wireless technologies where laying those cables is quite expensive. An alternative, put wireless uh, transmitters or transceivers on top of buildings and connect them together across Bangkok to create a wireless internet service provider. So that's where having no wires is of benefit when deploying and maintaining the cables is too expensive. And of course the other benefit of wireless is that the users or the devices can move. We have mobility. But there's also benefits of wireless when we don't want mobility. We have fixed users. Now the benefits, what's the problem with using wireless compared to wired communications? Transmitting data across a wireless channel is not as good as transmitting across a wired channel. It's not as robust. It doesn't cope. Uh, a, well, we have more errors when we transmit. The signal at the receiver can be uh, weaker. More errors lead to, if we talk about transmitting packets, more packet losses. And when we look at things like TCP, we'll see that leads to retransmissions. Retransmissions may, mean lower throughput. From the end user's perspective, more errors means lower data rate for the user. In wireless channels, we normally have higher delays. That is, we send our data. If we need to retransmit a packet, then it takes more time for our data to get to the destination because we send a packet. If it doesn't get there, we need to send again. That takes more time than just sending it without a retransmission. Because we have more errors, we may have more retransmissions, higher delay, and lower throughput. Also, in a wireless channel, it varies. The conditions vary over time. If I take my laptop, I can connect to a wireless access point. The signal strength would be a certain value. And I can transfer data at some data rate. If I move my laptop to the back of the room, the data rate may go down because the signal strength to the access point goes, goes down. So moving leads to variations in the environment because if I move my laptop from here to the back of the room, then there are different obstructions. There are more people between my laptop and the access point out there and people obstruct signals, more furniture, different walls and so on. So because of mobility and the environment, that is the obstructions around, the conditions change, again leading to lower performance. So basically the performance of our communications is much lower in a, wired, in a wireless channel compared to a wired channel. That's something we need to deal with. Also, the spectrum that we have available, the amount of bandwidth that we can transmit on is limited. And we cannot simply add more bandwidth to get a higher data rate. We can do that with wires. I have, in theory, we can do it quite easily. I want to connect two PCs together. They're maybe 10, 20 meters away. They support one gigabit per second Ethernet. And if I connect together by one cable, then I've got a data rate of a bit less than one gigabit per second. One gigabit per second data rate minus some overheads. If I need to go faster than that, I need more than one gigabit per second, what I could do is for my PC buy a second LAN card, very cheap, and for both of them, and use a second cable. Run the cables next to each other, and I've doubled the data rate that I can achieve, up to two gigabits per second. So that's possible with wires because the signal sent on this wire 
generally does not interfere with a signal sent on this wire because we have protection and shielding around them. So that's easy. With wireless, that's not so easy because if I was using Wi-Fi to connect, we basically have an inbuilt transmitter. We send our signal wirelessly. Let's say I could send it 300 megabits per second, one of the, the higher data rates for wireless LAN. That's not enough. What do I do? Buy a second wireless LAN card, put it in here, and transmit. We can do that if we use a different frequency channel. That would be successful. But if we only have one channel available, then that second transmission will interfere with the first. If we transmit on the same frequency, the two signals, even if we have two separate transmitters, if we transmit on the same frequency, the signals will interfere with each other and effectively we will still just get 300 megabits per second. Because in wireless the signals disperse everywhere, or disperse usually all around us, they interfere with other signals. Introducing a second transmitter doesn't necessarily give us an increase in, in performance because it may interfere with the first transmitter. That becomes an issue because the amount of bandwidth we have and the frequencies that we can transmit on is limited in the wireless spectrum. We must share that amongst all the users. As a result, we much harder to increase the performance by simply adding more transmitters. We'll see that more when we look at in detail of how wireless LAN works and the different channels available. What else is the problem with wireless communications? Many internet protocols, including TCP, were designed assuming that there'll be very few errors on the link, almost a perfect link. TCP has a retransmission scheme. It works well. But if there are many errors and many packets get lost, TCP performance goes down. In wireless links, we have many errors. TCP performance can go down to be very, very bad in some cases. You may, even, you may have even experienced that. If you use your Wi-Fi to transfer a large file, maybe a DVD, several gigabytes, you'll see that with a wireless link, then the throughput of that transfer can be very small because there are many errors across the wireless link. In your assignment, you'll have to investigate that. Other aspect of wireless versus wired is security is a problem, but we're not touching upon security in this course. We have some benefits, but we have many challenges, especially from performance. Benefits in terms of it's easy to use, easier to install, we can be mobile. Challenges are that the channel is worse than wired and our performance is much less normally. We've probably seen this before. You've seen this or a similar diagram last year. What do we, how do we treat a wireless transmission? Well, we have a transmitter and a receiver separated by some distance, D. If we focus on a point-to-point -point link initially, we transmit some signal at some power level at the transmitter. The nature of physics is that that signal loses strength as it disperses and the signal is received with some power level, PR. The relationship between PR and PT depends upon the distance and different factors. That is, the amount of power loss between transmitter and receiver depends on how far apart they are, the distance, what frequency the signal was when we transmitted. Are we transmitting a low frequency signal, which will go a long way, or a high frequency signal? How big the antenna is. 
If you remember, we had an equation last semester for the antenna gain. Basically, the larger the antenna, the larger the gain, and the further we can transmit, or the stronger the power level at the receiver. The directionality of the antenna, a, an antenna that focuses its signal in one direction will have more power in that direction. An antenna that disperses the signal will be weaker in a particular direction. So point-to-point -point links can go much further than an omnidirectional antenna, such as what's used in your laptop. And of course, obstructions. People are obstructions. People have a lot of water in them, and signals don't pass through water very well, say Wi-Fi signals. So basically, you put a laptop in here and transmit a signal to, say, some access point at the back of the room. The signal strength between them, if there were no people in here, may be good. If you put a lot of people in here, the signal strength will be lower because the signal needs to pass through people. So obstructions. People, furniture, walls, trees, all reduce the received signal strength. What we do is we encode the, the, the digital data into an analog signal and transmit. And the receiver receives an analog signal and does the decoding. And the methods that we use for the encoding and decoding will impact upon the data rate that we can transmit over that link. If the signal received is above some certain power level, then in practice a, the receiver can successfully decode or understand that signal. And that power level and the ability to understand it and decode depends upon the actual receiving device and the technology used. If the signal is below this power level, then we normally assume that the receiver cannot understand what was transmitted. If the signal received is too low, nothing will be received. No data will be received. What do we care about? This is the same wireless transmission, but a simpler view. We transmit with some power level over some distance. And to the receiver, we'll focus on the transmission range. What distance can we transmit across? At what data rate and using what frequency? So a simpler view of that previous model is that we're interested in how fast can we send the data in some wireless communications channel? What data rate can we achieve? Measured in bits per second. So when we want to select a wireless product or a wireless technology, one thing that will compare different technologies based upon is the data rate. What data rate can it offer us? We also care about the transmission range. How far can we transmit with that particular tr technology? Can we transmit tens of meters or tens of kilometers? Depending on our requirements, we need to choose a technology that offers us offers us an appropriate transmission range, measured in meters. That depends on what we want to achieve for our, uh, our network. If we want to just communicate between devices around someone's body or inside an office, then we need a range of meters, possibly, centimeters. If we want to connect two buildings, we may need kilometers. So we choose a technology that gives us the appropriate range. We care about the frequency that is used for that signal. What frequency it is, or the what range of frequencies, and especially if it's free or licensed. Because uh, the radio spectrum that is available is managed by international and national organizations, you can only use a certain portion of the spectrum for your different devices. Some portions of the spectrum you need a license to use that. You need to pay a government organization to get access to transmit on that frequency. That costs money. Some 
portions of the spectrum are free or unlicensed, like wireless LAN. I don't have to get a license to use my wireless LAN. It's, an, uh, it's transmitting in an unlicensed portion of the spectrum. If I want to build my own mobile phone network, I will need to get a license to allow mobile phones to transmit to, our, to my base stations. And you would have heard about the 3G licensing uh, plans in Thailand and talking about millions, billions of baht to get a license to transmit in a particular frequency. So the frequency that the technology uses is important from our perspective because it has some cost associated with it. And also, there may be interference on particular frequencies, especially the free or unlicensed bands or channels. If I want to transmit on a free frequency channel, then if someone else is also using it, our transmissions may interfere and our performance will go down. So it makes sense I use a frequency that someone else is not using so that there's less interference and higher performance. So when we choose a technology, we need to consider what frequency it uses. Also, we care about what the transmit power is of our technology, especially if we're using mobile devices, because the higher the transmission power, the more power it consumes of your battery and therefore the less time your battery will last in your mobile device. So we would like to use a low transmit power if possible, and then our battery will last longer. But if we use a low transmit power, our range will go down. If we change our frequency, our data rate will change, and our range will change. So all of these factors are interrelated. The other thing we care about is cost, how much a particular technology costs. Cost is not just related to the frequency, but the devices to encode and decode the signals have different costs involved. So when you choose a wireless technology, the key things to consider are these five. Data rate, range, frequency, power, and cost of the technology. What about everyone, yesterday we did a survey, most people use wireless LAN or Wi-Fi for their internet access. What data rate can you achieve with your laptop and Wi-Fi? Anyone know? What do you think? Or your, you have Wi-Fi on your mobile phone? What data rate does it connect with? 9 megabits per second doesn't sound very common. But data rate is normally the rate at which we send the, the bits across the link. The throughput normally is less than the data rate because we have different overheads. When we talk about a wireless technology, often we'll compare data rates, not throughput. The data rate is normally specified as part of the standard. In wi wireless LAN, common ones, 11 megabits per second, 54 megabits per second, and there are faster ones, 108 megabits per second, 300 megabits per second. What does your phone uh, connect at? Well, N. N. And in fact, each of them have a range of different values. 150 megabits per second, some wireless N, 802.11 N will cover. So Different standards, even for wireless LAN, offer different data rates. They're improving over time. So talking about the tens of megabits per second, one or 200 megabits per second as data rates for wireless LAN. How far can your wireless device transmit? About 300 meters. Does anyone use it in, say, in a dorm or in home, wireless, wireless LAN? Hands up. How far are you, are you away from the access point? Uh, how far do you, are you normally away from the access point? 
10 meters, tens of meters possibly. In, if, you, if you're inside a building with concrete walls, then tens of meters can be actually the limit. If you start to go further, then your signal will be too weak. So inside buildings, transmission range of wireless LAN, we're talking about meters, 10, 20, 30 meters in some cases. Outside, connect, say, an antenna on this building, maybe hundreds of meters outside, because there are less obstructions. What frequency does your wireless LAN use? Who pays for a license for their wireless LAN? No one, because it uses an, what's called an unlicensed portion of the spectrum. What frequency does it use? 2.4 gigahertz is the most common one. So 2.4 gigahertz used by wireless LAN. Some, 802.11a or a variant of 11n, supports also 5 gigahertz. The benefit of that is that many people use 2.4 gigahertz and they may interfere with each other. If there's someone else in your building that has an access point, you will see that when you try to connect. And you may interfere in transmissions with them and get a lower throughput. If you use a different frequency, like 5 gigahertz, which not many people use, less interference, more throughput for you. So choosing a frequency is important. How much transmit power does your mobile device use? Or wireless LAN transmitter? Anyone have an idea? It's in the order of milliwatts. Usually 10, 30 milliwatts, maybe 100 milliwatts with a high power transmitter. So well, you can buy devices that do uh, one watt but typically a, a mobile device would transmit at a power of say 10 milliwatts, 30 milliwatts, maybe 100 milliwatts. The larger the transmit power, the further the distance, but as you transmit, if you turn on your wireless LAN on your mobile phone and you leave it on all day and using it, your battery will be consumed much faster than if it's off because it's consuming the power. How much does your wireless LAN cost? Buy a phone without Wi-Fi, buy the same spec phone with Wi-Fi, what's the cost difference? Almost zero. That is very cheap. The transmitter in tens, hundreds of baht. That is uh, very cheap to include in a device that costs thousands of baht. We will look at some other wireless technologies and compare them on these factors as well. Let's talk a little bit more about spectrum. Spectrum, frequency, and bandwidth. When we transmit a signal, this is a simplification. We transmit really at a range of frequencies normally. That is, we don't transmit at a single frequency. We transmit a signal from frequency 1 up to frequency 2. And the range of signals, or the difference between the minimum frequency component and the maximum, is the bandwidth. The set of all possible frequencies is a spectrum. If you remember back, we spoke about that it, last semester that when we transmit a signal, it, the signal is made up of different frequency components. So sometimes what we'll say is, or what you may see, if this is hertz and this is the signal strength, this is our signal that we transmit. We in fact are transmitting a signal ranging from this frequency, frequency 1, up to this one. That is, the power is strong between these two frequencies. The bandwidth is the width, or the difference between F2 and F1. If this was 
1 megahertz and this was 2 megahertz or 3 megahertz, then the bandwidth is 2 megahertz. So we have a bandwidth. Our signals that we transmit are actually a range of frequencies, but often we talk about a center frequency. When I said your wireless LAN transmits at 2.4 gigahertz, in fact, your wireless LAN transmits at a range of frequencies. The center frequency is around 2.4 gigahertz. In fact, it's, there are some specific values that I will show later. But it has a particular bandwidth. It's not just 2.4 gigahertz. It, is plus or minus 10 megahertz and in fact has a bandwidth of normally 20 megahertz wireless LAN as an example. So in fact when someone says we transmit at a particular frequency that's normally referring to the center frequency. We actually transmit at a range of frequencies. If this is the center frequency the center frequency is 2.4 gigahertz and we have a bandwidth of 20 megahertz, then we're transmitting from what? 2 2.3, 2.3, 2.390 up to 2.410 gigahertz. So we transmit at a range of frequencies. But the thing we often care about, the bandwidth and the center frequency. And that's when you hear about specifications of standards and, and devices. You'll see specified the center frequency or the approximate center frequency and sometimes the bandwidth. Why do we care about them? They have the frequency that we use and the bandwidth we use have an impact upon the data rate that we can achieve, the range, interference and cost all those factors that we just said that we care about. Generally, higher bandwidth and higher frequency gives us a higher data rate. Make the bandwidth 40 megahertz, we can send at approximately double the speed. And that's what 802.11n does. At 20 megahertz bandwidth, we can transmit, I think, at 150 megabits per second. If we double the bandwidth to 40 megahertz, we can double the data rate to 300 megabits per second. So by transmitting at a larger, across a larger bandwidth, we can get a higher data rate. Also, the higher frequencies in the spectrum usually al allow a larger bandwidth, or larger bandwidth channels, and we get higher data rate. So, higher bandwidth and frequency is good for us in terms of higher data rate, but higher frequency leads to shorter range. If you go back to our free space propagation loss, we have equations that relate transmit power, receive power, distance and frequency. If you look at that equation, you'll see that if you increase the frequency f, you'll decrease the range, the distance. So there's a trade-off that we need to consider. Also, different frequency signals are affected by obstacles in different ways. Infrared remote control for your TV will not pass through a wall very well. You can not control the TV very well if it's on the other side of a wall because that range of frequencies do not pass through the obstructions. The, the materials inside the wall as much as a wireless LAN 2.4 gigahertz frequency. Wireless LAN, the signal can pass through walls with some power loss, but not a significant power loss. That's why I can connect to an access point outside. So yeah. lower frequency can pass through the obstacle different? Yes. Higher frequency is normally obstructed more by different, and by different obstacles or different materials, different chemicals. Yes. Uh, 
yes. Um, RF has a DC component. Uh, so, yeah, the harmonics, the harmonic frequency will interfere. But not always. Yeah.